Hello, and welcome to I Am The End Of The Words. In this installment, we have the 1915, I believe it was? 1915, somewhere around there. The 1915 Charlotte Perkins Gilman piece, Herland, or Herland. I will probably refer to it as both. Um, this will cover a thing that's very much in the world right now, very much in the news, and it's feminism. This is a novel of about a lost feminine... Nope. Nope. A lost feminist utopia. And um, a little bit on Charlotte Perkins Gilman really quick. She, I believe, was born around 1860 or so. Um, it has it in here. Hold on. Need to fact check here. Uh, 1860 she was born. She was a very prominent uh, sociological writer. She wrote some of the scathing books about uh, her most known was her most known book was called the yellow wallpaper it was a, a short story I believe I've never read it but it's a short story about her with postpartum depression it's a tale it's I need to check it out because it sounds pretty great but I guess she was a feminist her whole life um, well a feminist socialist her whole life and she wrote a lot of things about it this unbelievably enough sounds like it would be terrible but it is, it seems timeless almost. Let me set the stage for you. We have three college friends and they learn of this, by the way, they're all, they all have different personalities one, we'll get into that later. But we have three college friends who want to go exploring and they want to go adventuring and they hear of this land where there's only women, there's no men. And their first thought is, well, there's definitely men. There can't, there can't be a society without men. So they end up uh, funding a trip there. Uh, they, you know, get a plane, they get a boat, they they fly over this place and they look down and they see this whole civilization, they see architecture, they see paved roads, they see just a whole metropolis almost. Uh, by the way, the book is set kind of right on the brink of World War One, but like I said, it seems timeless. And because most of the story takes place inside of this utopia, your view of the utopia can kind of be timeless because you can kind of add and take away what you want. Um, cause she's descriptive, but to a point of, if this makes sense, she's generally descriptive, but not complete. It, it makes sense. Um, but the three guys soon kind of sneak around in the woods. They're trying to around the perimeter. Um, three young nymphs, as it's kind of described, three young women, um, approach them. They speak a different language. Uh, and upon trying to, you know, talk to them, the three girls climb into a tree and the guys follow them. By the way, it's, it's, it's first it's noted that these girls are incredible climbers. They're incredibly athletic. They just look beautiful. Um, they climb into the tree, eventually try to still talk, but you know, doesn't work. They speak different languages. Um, the girls take off and just sprint away towards the, the closest city, closest town, I guess you could say. Um, the guys pursue, and as they get to this crest of this hill, they see that the girls are drastically far away. They, they, they said there's no way they could have spread that far. There all, there's a lot of sci-fi, it feels, in this. It wasn't intended that way, but in this world we live in where everything is sci-fi based, and there's a lot of sci-fi in every form of media we watch, every television show, every movie, there's a hint of sci-fi somewhere. Not complaining, but you could definitely see a lot of sci-fi in this, and there were moments where I thought, hey, maybe this is a sci-fi book. But it's not. Um, there's there's some very funny parts in this book, too. Um, well, let's get right into when they get into the utopia. The three friends get into the utopia, and they're still they're still looking at all the architecture. They're looking at all the, the advances they've made, and every one of them can only come to one conclusion. It's that there's men around here. There has to be men. Women can't do this. Women, women, women. And not just women, you know, this would be women World War One. Look at how, think of how women were looked at World War One. Um, so these three college age bros, if you will, um, no way. Where's the dudes? Where's the dudes? There's dudes. Has to be dudes. Dudes, where are they? Um, they end up getting basically chloroformed by women that they, they come to refer to as, I want to say wardens. It's, it's something along those lines, but they were very, very stoic, very close cropped hair women. 
Um, not very beautiful. And they all get imprisoned in this kind of just one big room. Comfortable bed, comfortable sheets. They get fed. They get time to like exercise. It's a very comfortable prison, yet it's still a prison. During this time, they're being educated. They're being taught the language so they can communicate with the feminists of this utopia. Um, eventually, they're trying to make a break. They try to escape. Um, I think it's kind of hazy. I don't know if I paid attention too much, like if I was reading past it. But it seems like the entire civilization, the entire utopia is kind of at the top of a high peak. And at one point, there was an earthquake or something. And there's no real way for them to get down. Like, that's why they had to fly up. And they were trying to get down off the cliffs to their boat, which they left. Um, but as they descend, they get down to their boat. Or no, it, it could have, probably was their plane. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't They get to their vehicle. And there's like a bag on it. And they can't get it open. They have nothing to cut it with. And it's then when those three girls who they encountered earlier appear and uh, they make a last ditch effort to try to capture them, to try to get them so they have a hostage, they have some type of negotiation. Um, when that doesn't work out, here comes all the, I wish I could remember the name for them, the, the stoic women, the police force, if you will, the, the more rough, if you will, women, the more, the more worker type women. Um, and it's, it's come to realize that they have been followed the whole time. They've just been watched. And the, the women were going to see what they were going to do. When they get back, they get put in the same room. Nothing has changed. They don't take their bed away. They don't punish them. Just same work, same education. Um, the more and more they learn of the language, they find out that eventually they were going to get introduced to the rest of the population. They were going to. They just needed to see if they were dangerous. They wanted to teach them the language. They wanted to know what their world was like. Um, once the conversations back and forth start to happen, that's when we really get into the meat of this book. We get past the appetizer, the mozzarella sticks are done, and we're digging into a nice big piece of chicken. Um, the way that feminism is approached in this is it's their basis of everything, kind of. And it is a little bit of an aged feminism because a lot of it is based on motherhood, although I'll get into that as well. Um, I'm trying not to make this too long, but this book has a lot in it, but I'm going to just try to skim it. There will probably be moments I get into it, though. Um, they begin being questioned by these women and questioned about their society because these women have no idea about the outside world. They know there is an outside world. They knew there were men at one point, but there aren't any now in their civilization. Um, hold on. Let me drink Um, as they're learning about our everything, it, it, it becomes kind of a commentary because as these three men are telling the women about our society, about our, the way our women are treated, the way our economy works, the way we treat our own people, our religion, it becomes a commentary not only on the feminist way of doing it and this feminine socialist utopia, but it comes a commentary on how poorly we have decided to act. And this was break of World War One. So whatever we were doing bad then, a, a, a bit of it got worse. So like I said, it seems very contemporary at times and it doesn't read as this type of Victorian era book. Like I always anticipate things made before 1970 to read. It reads very well it, it, it seems so now when you read it. Um, and the, our three characters, uh, the one, I'm going to get into how they differ now. The one is kind of a, he's so on board with the feminist ways. He's kind of a, he feels like he's a slave to women. He loves women so much. He wants to almost worship women. That's the one friend. That's Jeff. The other friend, Terry, is the opposite. He's a man's man. He just feels like women need to be dominated. He feels like they want to be dominated. And he gets into trouble with that later. And then the one telling the story, it's not a name like Jeff or or, or Terry. It's, it's a strange vad vilk or something. It doesn't matter. But he's kind of right in the middle. He, he tries to look for the logical path. He will accept whatever, you know, seems better. So... No matter what aspect you're in here, if you're talking, you know, religion, if you're talking childbearing, if you're talking economics, if you're talking how to, you know, feed your whole country, there's always somebody to relate to no matter how you feel. 
And it this this three pronged attack that they're always going into every situation with really gives you a full scope of every of every situation. Um, eventually, they do get released, if you will, into the you know, the normal society, and time passes, and they just live there, and they kind of give these speeches about their society. Um, and eventually, I mean, a lot of things happen. We go through a lot of different things. We find out their religion is solely based on motherhood. The reason they can bear children, it's a, by the way, it's an all, obviously it's a feminist utopia, no men. All the children that are born are women, and it's because there is a motherly god, I can't remember her name, it wasn't Venus or anybody like that, but there was a motherly god that they worship who gave certain families the right to just have a kid without sex, um, without the opposite sex, obviously, also. And as their, you know, as their population changed and only this, this, you know, very godly people had the kids, that is who became the population. It, the, the rest of the society weeded themselves out through, I mean, let's be honest, the ones who are going to have the kids are going to be the ones that survive. Uh, but from a very early age, the way they raise their children is everybody's a mother. The whole community are mothers in some way. And there's no punishment there. There's because nobody's bad because they, they said that got bred out. Um, the kids don't go to school because they're just educated. And there's this general consensus through everybody that lives there that everybody that lives there kind of knows the same basic thing. There's just individual people who have their own specialties. Um, it is for all intents and purposes, a utopia. It's, it's paradise for every one of them. Um, they have, they have killed off, uh, any meat. There's no re there's no need for sheep and cows or anything. Sheep are the last to go. I believe it says in here, they just have a lot of fruit bearing trees. They have a lot of crops and it, it seems like we have a perfect ecosystem self-contained in this utopia. Um, the three men eventually get told that they, they're wanted to be the men to bring the men back into the society. And they want to have a bisexual race is what they called it. Um, there's a long story about a war and all kind of shit of why the, why the men disappeared to begin with. Um, but, and by the way, I'm missing a lot. This thing is, it, this thing is great. I, even before I finish this, I want to say I highly recommend this book for anybody even remote, no, not even remotely interested in feminism because this book will make you think about feminism when you're not, when you don't even think you're thinking about feminism. And it may not be a current way you're thinking of feminism, but I think if we're thinking about feminism, if somebody's thinking about feminism, even in a different term, it's still better than not thinking about feminism and acting like it doesn't exist. Um, well, that the opposite doesn't exist. I mean, I'm, I fully believe in feminism. I think men and women should be equal. I don't think that needs to be said, but I feel like I need to say it because I'm putting this on the internet where I don't want to end up on Fox News. I don't want to talk to Nancy Grace because she's a ghoul. Um, so I just needed to state that, uh, eventually the men end up getting a type of relationship with the three women who they actually encountered in the woods. Um, and each one of these women has a different personality that can complement or kind of contradict the one they're with. And they plan on getting married. But the thing is, there's a different kind of love for these women because Love is not the same kind of love that men know, that, that it is with women and men in a bisexual race, because the only love they've known for a thousand, two thousand years has been the love of either your kids or the love of your friends. They didn't have a love like that. So it's different for them and the men don't understand it. There's a lot of ways that they look at women in this. Uh, Terry, the really dominating one, said, I think it's Terry. We're going to go with Terry. Um, he said something like, these women aren't attractive, or these women don't have attractiveness. And the the one telling the story, the one who's kind of in the middle, said that maybe the things that we see in women that are that, that seem feminine to us are just reflections of masculinity. And it's it, like, I'm telling you, there's some crazy things that get said in here that made me think of other things that I've never thought before. Um, eventually, they do get married. Um, after many, many rough ships and arguments between everybody, um, many misunderstandings, because, you know, how, how do you even compare the world you live in with the world that they've been living in? Obviously, 
every time there's an argument, uh, we have Terry on one side, which is the men's side because he thinks he can run, he can rule all. And then we have Jeff, who always takes the women's side no matter what. Uh, eventually, Terry gets... Oh, by the way, Jeff and his wife love each other unconditionally. He, they, they're, they're, they can't get away from each other. They, it's a different kind of love. Jeff loves her in a certain way, and she kind of just, you know, loves him a different way. But um, the guy telling a story, what the hell is his name? It's it's not... Uh, da, 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 da. It's going to bother me. It's going to bother me. And now I'm wasting time. I'm getting really... It's Vandick. Vandick Jennings. So Vandick... Him and his wife honestly seem like soulmates. They, they they love being around each other. They like just spending time together. But once again, there's a different connection from her to him. Um, and eventually, Terry, who with his girl with his wife, uh, they're constantly on and off. They're arguing. They break up. They get back together. They break up. They get back together. Uh, he decides that he's going to do the manly thing: surprise her in her bed and try to have his way with her because that is what men do. Um, he attacks her, gets subdued. His punishment is he has to leave, but he can't leave alone. So Vanduk, that does not sound like a name. I'm just going to call him Van. So Van has to leave with him because it's safer to fly the plane with two people. His wife won't let him leave without her. So she's going to the States with him. Um, Jeff is going to stay there because he has impregnated his wife. So that is going to be the first kid born with the, uh, in a bisexual race. Um, so Terry has to leave alone. He's going to be exiled. Um, Van and his wife plan on coming back, but they're going to go to the States. And there is reference here because he's telling Van telling the story. He's telling it many years later. And he like references certain things. He said they had wonderful adventures in the States. They had wonderful adventures in, you know, around the world. And it ends with everybody agreeing to not, tell anybody about Herland. And it's interesting because the whole book, they were kind of teasing. She was kind of teasing this, the, the wonderful times that they had with, you know, when he brought his wife back to the States. And I really want to read that. I want to see her reaction to it because even before taking her there, he has to like sit around and say, listen, there's things I didn't tell you. We have prisons we have we we have poverty, a lot of it, but she just wants to meet the mothers who are stay at home and all they are they take care of their kids. That's what she wants to meet. She wants to see how that society of women work. Um, it was something, man. I didn't I did not expect it to be what it was, and I I really really enjoyed it. Um, it's a commentary on masculinity. It's a commentary on feminism. It's a commentary on on our religious aspects. It's a commentary on the way we think about each other. It's a commentary on love. It's a commentary on friendship. It's a commentary on everything. And it's, it makes you think. Any book that makes you think is a book worth reading. So I really recommend picking up Herland and reading it. And I am fully behind feminism. So I made this flag. Uh, please, please acknowledge that my flag post is a banana. I did not have, I, I did not know what to use. So I recommend this. Um, and I give this an 8.5 out of 10. I don't give them 0.5s, but I gotta give it 8.5. Uh, I'll give it a 9. Just because I don't like giving 0.5s. It's a 9. 9 out of 10. And uh, feminism, I salute you. Banana. Banana. Banana flag.